this is the last talk of a very exciting morning. And uh, we change mass scale. I will be talking about massive black holes and we go to space. I was asked to review on our current understanding of the astrophysical processes that are conducive to the formation and coalescence of massive black holes that we aim at detecting at low frequencies with LISA. Uh, LISA aims at discovering uh, massive black holes mainly across all cosmic ages. Here I'm showing lines of constant signal-to-noise ratio in the plane redshift versus binary mass in the source race frame. And you can clearly see that LISA will detect black holes coalescences in the mass interval, say, between 10 to the 4 and a few times to the 7 with very high uh, signal to noise <coughs> ratio. And uh, really would like to detect the earliest black holes, if they are there, forming out of redshift 14 when the universe is really has an age which is a fraction of a giga year, which are swiftly drifting through uh, accretions and perhaps uh, multiple mergers to explain the very luminous quasars we see at Redshift 7. But also, we would like really to detect uh, the black holes, uh, say, with masses comparable to the black hole in our old Milky Way, again forming a QSO, but also accounting for the low luminosity active galactic nuclei undergoing downsizing that we really see at lower redshifts. And around also, so we would like to cover the epoch of cosmic reionization and the epoch where we have the peak of the star formation rate. Uh, the signal to noise ratio scales with the square root of the mass ratio and of course uh, we might have really golden binaries that we can detect uh, with an SNR or more than a thousand. Lisa traces uh, the black hole really cosmic drift and traces the cosmic assembly of galaxies. Black holes, we know, are minuscule because uh, their horizon for a typical LISA black hole is a fraction of a microparsec. Coalescing binary black holes in the LISA band are sort of minuscule because we see, depending on the mass and the redshift, thousands or less cycles uh, during the late spiral merger and ring down. So we can go out of 100 Schwarzschild radii. And since this gravity is the weakest interaction in nature, this means that for a binary with total mass MB and symmetric mass ratio nu, the coalescence time at a given eccentricity, which I never consider extreme, uh, is scaling with the fourth power of the semi-major axis. This is another way of saying that the scale of gravitational wave driven in spiral is really minuscule compared to the galactic dimensions. If you just set the coalescence time of the order of the then cosmic time or uh, of the difference between two adjacent redshifts, then you learn about uh, at which distance uh, the two black holes has to be driven in order for gravitational wave really to take over. So, uh, and again, uh, this uh, scale is minuscule compared to these galactic dimensions. So we have a, a separation problem similar to the one we have uh, to consider in the formation of stellar origin black holes. Uh, the uh, 
critical distance uh, is weakly dependent on the mass and is of the order of a milliparsec. Uh, so, if we want to detect a coalescence event at Rachi 15, when the universe is only three million years old, we really have to take this two black hole on this tiny scale. Uh, the condition is less critical if you go down to redshift 3 because we have more time. So it is clear that uh, we need a chain of dissipative processes of non-gravitational wave origin uh, that have to drive the formation of these massive uh, black hole binaries. And uh, this is associated to the clustering of uh, galaxy halos. Thus, this is really an exquisite cosmological problem which is encompassing more than 10 orders of magnitude in physical scale. And we would like to know whether, uh, what is the role of stars, of gas, in driving these black holes down to this tiny separation? Do we have bottlenecks, failures, that is, we have wandering black holes? It is clear then the quest for efficient binary hardening from cosmological scales to galactic and from galactic to subgalactic scale is clearly instrumental for the detection of high redshift events. And also it makes predictions on merger rates extremely challenging and so just this tune in the afternoon because Marta will really talk about the rates. So in general, so imagine you have two massive black holes in a Redmond galaxy and customarily you think that uh, dynamical friction against stars is really uh, uh, causing the pairing of the two black holes, the two black holes are losing orbital energy and angular momentum until they form a Keplerian binary when their orbital velocity is comparable to the velocity dispersion of the uh, background stars or say when the mass enclosed in the black hole binary orbit is comparable to the mass in stars. And this is of the order of one parsec. But then you have to take the two black hole and let us try to really harden the binary down to this very tiny scale where the orbital velocity is really huge. So you have really to bridge an important uh, uh, gap through this uh, critical hardening phase. So we have a number of Cartigan questions. Do these are really black hole coalesce on clock as soon as their host halos merge. There is an intrinsic time delay and we would like to know what is the delay distribution and how does it depend on redshift, masses of the black holes, mass ratio, gas versus stellar content, orbit, galaxy morphology. And as an ancillary question, we would like also to know how fast black holes grow via accretion during a halo, halo merger. After all, the accretion time scale can be of the order of 50 million years for a radiative efficiency of 10% and an Eddington luminosity, uh, and a luminosity close to Eddington. And this is also may really affect the value of the spin during the process of clustering. Let me first start by uh, describing the portrait of an isolated gas-rich major merger between two disk galaxies. Time zero is set by the initial condition and you can clearly see that the merger is consumed after about two giga years. Uh, the merger is gas-rich in these still frames. You just see the, the gaseous disk components. The two black holes are just uh, at the center of the potential well and are also surrounded by a bulge. What we have learned from a series of simulations by uh, many groups, I'm reporting this nice simulation by Capello et al., is that if we want to understand uh, the dynamics uh, on the galactic scale when the two black holes at this time are getting very close, we need, really, really need 
to trace uh, in detail uh, uh, the tidal perturbation that the secondary disk uh, is uh, suffering uh, during mainly the closest uh, pericentric passages. There you have that the collision of the two interstellar uh, media and also you might have episodes of star formation. Indeed, here I'm showing uh, for the primary black hole and the secondary black hole, I'm showing uh, the black hole binary separation. They start at 70 kiloparsec and uh, they come closer and closer down to the force resolution limit that in this simulation is about 10 parsec. And uh, they are not still forming a Keplerian binary, but they are really close to see each other. What is interesting is that in particularly in the less massive disk galaxy, uh, during the closest pericentric passages, you have a burst of star formation and also some mild accretion. And uh, the surrounding of the, so the nearest uh, uh, surroundings of the black hole is then uh, sort of enshrouded by a stellar cusp that in a sense uh, is enhancing the effective mass by dynamical friction and promoting the decay uh, down to uh, this scale. If you uh, uh, run a series of simulation varying uh, the mass ratio, then you find out that the lower the mass ratio is, the longer it takes uh, the two black holes to really come close and see each other forming a Keplerian binary, simply because the secondary galaxy, the secondary disk is lighter and also uh, dynamical friction against the dark matter uh, halos is becoming weaker and weaker. And consensus is rising that below a ratio of 1 to 10, uh, the secondary uh, galaxy is so tidally stripped that you might have wandering black holes. So the take home message is that we understood that we need really uh, to track uh, uh, the merger since the very early stages in order not to miss key features in the dynamics of the black holes, that we might have wandering black holes, especially at low mass ratios, and uh, that the black hole mass contrast uh, tend to decrease in minor mergers and increase in major mergers. So there is a sort of unbalance between the two accretion rates uh, that has been uh, observed uh, uh, during the merger. And so we might have a preferential range of mass ratio that will introduce some selection or some bias in the future uh, detection of LISA event. So we have sort of a narrowing uh, of the values of the mass ratio. Well, if what I've shown was an isolated merger, let me just now move on and show uh, the portrait of a cosmological merger from Khan et al. Uh, they selected from a cosmological simulation a galaxy group at redshift 3.5. They identified the two main spiral undergoing really a major merger. Mostly the mergers are on parabolic orbit. These two galaxies were uh, on co-rotating, uh, so they had co-rotating stellar disk inclined. Here the gas fraction is poor compared to the previous case, and by using a splitting technique, they were able to combine an SPH simulation with a direct embodied code to show uh, three uh, interesting uh, uh, steps in the dynamical evolution of the black holes. First, they shown that gas inflows in the inner uh, 500 parsecs uh, from this time a cosmological stream um, are conducive to really an intense burst of star formation around the secondary which is accelerating the orbital decay by dynamical friction. And uh, so uh, the binary separation can reach 
really a stage where they form a Keplerian binary. And then since the remnant galaxy is really triaxial, then uh, the slingshot mechanism that is the individual interaction of stars within the binary uh, uh, is such that uh, uh, the binary can really uh, reach uh, the microparser scale where we, we see the, gravita the gravitational wave driven in spiral after only 10 million years after the core of the two galaxies has merged. The two black holes in this simulation are heavy, so these are not Lisa black holes. But uh, in any case, the message that we have to take away is that really gas provides the reservoir of new stars uh, that uh, then uh, can be uh, the principal actor in uh, extracting orbital energy and angular momentum in individual scatterings. So stars play a key role for the merger to stay on clock and gas help. Uh, as I was saying, this is just one single simulation, the only one we have in literature that was able to encompass the entire uh, dynamical range. And uh, so I was curious to understand whether black holes not of 10 to the 8 solar masses, but of 10 to the 5 solar masses, the LISA black hole can really reach the microparser scale on a reasonable uh, time scale. And so I just uh, uh, computed the lifetime of the binary by just evaluating the time at the crossing between the gravitational wave time scale, which is increasing as a to the fourth, a is the semi-major axis of the binary, and the hardening time, which is instead scaling as one over a, because as the binary hardens, the semi-major axis become smaller and smaller, and the cross-section of the binary uh, becomes smaller for the interaction of low angular momentum stars. This scale correlates with the underlying stellar and velocity dispersion and can be calculated at the inference radius of the black hole. And so here I just, uh, uh, I'm showing this solid line uh, varying the stellar background, which is a sort of in the vicinity of the black hole is scaling as a power law with various indices and making some modeling of the underlying host galaxies, we see that the binary lifetime can vary between 100 million years and can be of a few giga years. So we have a broadening, which is really sensitively depending on the underlying profile and velocity dispersion of the stars. For a while, we uh, considered, we thought that uh, gas can really accelerate the uh, pairing and hardening of the binary simply because around Mach number one, gas dynamical friction is three times more effective than the dynamical friction against stars. And so we start modeling uh, uh, a configuration as the one depicted here. So imagine you have, you had a major merger, gas rich, and so in the nuclear region you formed a very massive circumnuclear disk. Uh, and uh, we have that the secondary black hole is approaching the primary, which is just uh, sitting in the midst of the potential well. The disk is stabilized because there is also a bulge. And uh, it is, uh, was very clear that uh, mainly uh, at uh, pericenter, uh, the secondary black hole is heavily uh, uh, decelerated by the presence. And you can see this, this is a really wake, which is lagging behind. And since we ha you have a 
the deceleration at pericenter, at the end, the secondary black hole is really orbiting on a circular orbiting orbit. So it is just, it is dragged to rotate uh, with the overall structure. So we have a fast decay uh, on a time scale of 10 million years. But uh, the gas uh, doesn't remain in this state because gas is cooling, and so uh, fragmentation from inside out uh, is leading to the formation of very massive clumps that uh, are transient uh, features because clumps can merge, collide, but you have creating a really a multi-scale uh, interstellar medium, and so uh, this high-density constraint is leading, to, is leading to a completely different dynamics. Uh, just, uh, just look at the broad morphology of uh, uh, the dynamics here. We still have the black hole binary separation versus time. And in general, since you have lowered the underlying density background, uh, the dynamical uh, time scale of hardening becomes longer and longer. And so there is an increase in the sinking time. There is no circularization. And sometimes uh, the in close interaction of the secondary black hole with a cloud is kicking off the black hole out of the plane. And so there you can really delay uh, dynamical friction, uh, either controlled by stars or gas. So we could compute a spread in the delay times that can be between 2 and 100 million years. This is, uh, we are almost approaching the end of the story because then you uh, have reached, uh, not reached yet, the gravitational, drive, uh, gravitational wave driven in spiral. And so the common understanding is that when the two black holes are very close, say fraction of a parsec, uh, they still be surrounded by what we call a circumbinary disk. Uh, the two black holes are depositing orbital angular momentum uh, due to the quadrupolar nature of the interaction, which is exciting both uh, leading in the inner portion of uh, uh, the area and uh, trailing spiral waves. And so there is the belief that the two black holes are opening a gap, a sort of hollow region. And uh, what is interesting is that in the latest simulation we carried on and other people carried on, in reality this gap, which is twice the size of the binary, is filled of uh, uh, hot gas and the two black holes might grow a uh, mini disk that could be really relevant if we want to detect an electromagnetic counterpart at the moment of their uh, coalescence. Uh, the turbulence and gravito turbulence and viscosity in the circumbinary disk maintains the contact between the two black holes. And so as the two black holes migrate inward because the net balance of torques is negative, the gap follows the binary and still it is feeding the mini disk. But at some point when the gravitational wave will really drive the full in spiral, there is a detachment between the circumbinary disk and the two black holes, which is still may carry uh, their own uh, little accretion disks. Uh, so we, we really, how much does this, uh, 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 how much this process is going to last? There has been calculations that is indicating that may last for 
uh, 10 million years, we have only a fragmented survey of all these phenomena, so we cannot really have a full, complete uh, analysis of the time scale. But let me just mention this nice paper by Doty et al, who have just uh, have taken um, data from a sample of arctic galactic nuclei here from uh, uh, observations you can see that uh, uh, this is a figure where it's showing the mass accretion rate versus redshift for I'm done, for uh, various uh, uh, black hole masses and the message here is that if we just uh, take uh, uh, the information, so we use the information on the ac average accretion rate that black holes of various masses are experiencing from redshift 4 down to 0, and you make a very simplified model for the migration of the two black holes, then you can show that uh, black holes uh, 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 pairing uh, at redshift uh, larger than 2, 3 can really coalesce by redshift 2. And so we might have that the peak of um, the uh, ELISA event will be around the peak of the star uh, formation rate. So the take home message is uh, really that uh, uh, in massive nuclear disk, gas fragmentation lead to a broadening of the time but migration can really uh, drive the black hole down to the gravitational wave in spiral. It's likely we have two regimes. We need the presence of a massive stellar cusp to lead to swift coalescence of the black hole, hopefully have to, to see uh, high redshift mergers. Uh, we need gas, gas is forming stars, which help in making the stellar cusp steep, and at the same time, they may guarantee the, it may guarantee uh, the migration of the two black holes in the last uh, phasing. Setting the clock is both a cosmological and local problem, and we will really uh, need to survey uh, and to do uh, high resolution simulation. So, uh, the last word will be decided by Lisa that will really tell us uh, the full story. Let me remind you that ELISA will be really an observatory which will be signal dominated. The observability of the black holes out to very large redshift is not sensitivity limited. And let me just show these little dots here which has been derived from a semi-analytical model by Vailant et al, which is telling us how fast and swift uh, is the drift of a stellar origin black hole or heavy seeds uh, in the high redshift. And we really would like to catch these uh, coalescences. And this is really a challenge from a cosmological uh, perspective. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Questions? There must be questions. Avi. <clears throat> so there is uh, this possibility that all quasars are mergers. In other words, in all quasars, we have two black holes. That would be fantastic. <laughs> uh, do you have any reason? to um, argue otherwise, or do you think it's a possibility? Well, let's say that we do not have, we have observational evidence of dual AGN, so both uh, black holes are active in an ongoing merger, but still kiloparsec uh, uh, away. Instead, we have uh, very little evidence to see uh, active black holes on uh, milliparsec scale, they are very difficult to see. You, you, you might see them by looking at uh, off play, off, uh, um, of uh, broadline region that have might be uh, um, shifted relative to the narrow uh, line region. I know that there is a huge effort in, in finding these binary black holes. 
let's hope they are there because they are really a key uh, for Well, for one has to keep in mind that quasars are active only for 1% of the Hubble time. And yes. so catching both of them in action is it, a low probability. But the second black hole might still be there without being active. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yes. Just a, a question about this, this plot. It, it looks like I could draw some conclusion about the probability of seeing seed uh, binaries merging in Einstein telescope with this. Uh, uh, yes, I, I didn't dare to put also uh, uh, the sensitivity, the, the SNR, the, the line of constant SNR for Einstein telescope. Uh, let me tell you that uh, there might be indeed the possibility of really seeing these uh, high redshift seeds. Uh, so this plot is telling you that in order to make a black hole of 10 to the 9 uh, solar mass at redshift 7, you really need to start off at very early redshifts and you might have heavy seeds, the heavy seeds are these uh, little black dots, so you had a halo-halo merger with an heavy seed of 10 to the 5 solar masses in this model, which is paired and form a binary with a black hole of intermediate mass, which we don't know whether they exist. And these instead are POP3 seeds that have been forming in pristine dark matter halos, uh, metal-free, and they are just swifting rapidly, and ET can maybe reach uh, um, redshift uh, of around 10. It's clearly depend very much on the mass ratio. Um, it's, uh, uh, but we, these, all this point has been selected in order to fulfill the condition that the mass ratio is larger than 0.1. So, really they might be there, but there are many, many uncertainty because when you have two black holes, say POP3 of 200 solar masses, if they ever form, they have to meet each other and form a binary unless there is a mechanism which is in situ producing the binary. It's not as a consequence of a halo-halo merger. But you might have multiple black holes, you might have multiple triple interaction at very high redshift, and we are studying this right now to see whether this is the main channel for the formation, because you always need binaries, and so it's very, very difficult to, it's maybe easy to form a seed black, or a single individual seed black hole, but then you have to make it uh, with a binary, and this is much, much more complex. Okay, I don't see any other hands up, so let's thank Monica again.